a lot of people will plan out routes for the entire year. You miss out on some of the spontaneous moments that life will throw at you. Yeah. I feel like those are the moments everybody wants when they travel. They're like, oh yeah, when I was traveling, blah, blah, blah. I had this cool thing happen to me. Like you never hear anybody who plans for that spontaneous moment. Like it's just, it just doesn't happen. We've yeah. just heard some people who will start planning their life in a van. They have this strategy. Where like I'm working at this job now, but I'm gonna go ahead and start buying the van and converting it. And in six months, I'm gonna ask my boss if I can go remote. And we're, every time that scares us death. I'm like, don't do that. Like do it the other way around. Like you don't know what they're going to say and they could even fire you if they think that you're going to go remote. So yeah. just, uh, I think plan ahead and get yourself set up to a place where you can do this long term if you choose to do so. Hello, Pathfinders, and welcome to a Travel Path Podcast, a show that empowers you to achieve your travel goals and to live a lifestyle so that you can travel on your own terms. I'm your host, Tyler Hespler. Join Hope and I as each guest we interview shares their wisdom and knowledge so that you can take the actionable steps necessary to begin carving your path. Chris and Sarah, welcome to a Travel Path Podcast. Hey. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, Excited thank to be you. Here. Yeah, so we know you from your YouTube channel, Chris and Sarah, where you guys document your travels from all over the world and provide travel tips along the way. You traveled by van, bike, plane, Airbnb, auto <laughs> rickshaw, which I had no clue what that was until I watched your video. Um, and now most recently, you're a converted truck camper. I do want to give a quick yeah. shout out to Chad and Eileen Miles from the Miles Van Life on episode 18. They had mentioned that they really enjoyed your content because it showcased what living in a van was all about. Um, so guys, why don't you share a little about yourselves and say what's up to the Pathfinder community? Yeah. Yeah, you made us sound a lot weird and cool all at the same time. So yeah. <laughs> How should we and I guess maybe start with what an auto system. rickshaw is. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh man. Oh, man. That is our most prized possession. That was the biggest impulse buy of our lives. We, yeah. We're so proud of it. It's, it's a little three wheel like Indian rickshaw, like electric rickshaw. If you've seen the latest Indiana Jones movie, like he rides that. And it's just, it's what they ride around in India. We found one for sale in Atlanta, Georgia and <laughs> snagged it. So yes, yeah, so we have one of those sitting at home right now. And that's our, for a while, it was our commuter car around town. But mm -hmm. we oh, are actually Chris own it. I did not know that. Wow. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, no. It's sitting at home right now. <laughs> it's Yeah, it's, yeah, we miss it. Like, that's the only thing about traveling away from home. I'm like, oh, I don't get to drive the tuck. We call it the tuck tuck, but we don't get to drive the auto rickshaw around. But yeah, yeah we, we love it. that little thing. Yeah. Our it doesn't go very fast. We think it brings down the property value at our house. We, you know, we're the weird neighbors, but we don't care. <laughs> It looks fun. They don't seem to mind. <laughs> no, it is. Yeah. It is. If you guys are ever in Tennessee, we'll take you guys around town. Yeah. But yeah. So, um, so yeah, we're we're Chris and Sarah. We're um, I guess like you said, we're content creators on YouTube and we blog. We we do everything. Like I mean, you mentioned all these different vehicles or different ways that we've traveled, and I feel like that's our life in a nutshell. That we just do random bits of traveling and bring people along. Yeah, we're digital nomads, so we can pretty much work from wherever. And we've been digital nomads. Gosh, Chris has been fully remote for like 15 or 17 years now. And mm -hmm. our entire relationship, we've both been remote. So it's allowed us to pretty much go and do anything we want, which is awesome. Um, but we've done the whole van traveling thing for a couple of years. And now we're doing the Pan American Highway and a truck camper. And it just it's constantly growing and changing. But we love that. We love trying new things and not being, I guess niched in too much any one type yeah. of travel <laughs> <laughs> ah, very cool that's you guys are all over the place and that's the beauty of yeah, remote work you can just go from wherever 15 years i did not know that wow um you mentioned on your website we'll dial it back to kind of how this whole thing got started but you mentioned on your website that a few years ago you took a calculated risk and made a jump into a life that you love um what caused you to make that jump and what sort of things i guess were you calculating and considering before doing that mm. Yeah, um, we were, me, okay, uh, so at the time we were, what, two years into being married, we had had our first taste of digital nomad life by traveling to Thailand for a couple of months, and, mm -hmm. you know, people used to joke that you guys can work from anywhere, and that was the first chance of seeing, wow, we really could work from anywhere, so we went back to Seattle where we were living and lived there another two years and loved it, and then we started getting kind of restless, and we knew we wanted to travel, but rent's expensive in Seattle, and we were so young and on a newlywed budget, and we knew we needed to find, if we wanted to travel, it was going to have to be something different than just flying from country to country. So I stumbled into the whole van life bubble on Instagram one day and 
I don't think Chris, I didn't think Chris was going to be interested in it. No, the first thing that she did, she showed me this Instagram post and she was like, you'll never do this. It wasn't a threat. It was more just like, I can't see you living in a van. <laughs> Sounds and like a challenge. I, it was yeah, a challenge. That's why I'm like, you know what? You're right. I can't do this, but I'm going to do it now. Yep. So, like, <laughs> <laughs> And eight weeks later, we had a van. <laughs> yeah. So it was pretty quick. And we had already been contemplating like, do we do like an Airstream or do we do Airbnb to Airbnb or what that was going to look like? Mm -hmm. And then van life was the most affordable option. They raised our rent in Seattle again. And we were just tired of throwing money away to something that, you know, we love that city, but we also wanted to see the world. So we decided we'll go for now. And if we want to come back, we can come back. Yeah. Um, so we bought a van, converted it. And the amount of money that we put into the van conversion was what we would have paid for rent for a year in Seattle. So we sort of just you know, saved that amount. And then that's how we had justified it. it was, you know, we bought mm -hmm. the van. And technically with the van at the time, I'm not sure how the van market is now, but you were sort of like putting equity in the van, which is weird because it's a depreciating asset, but you convert it on your own. You do all this work, you put it into it. And then like the value is greater than what you actually put into it. So mm -hmm. it was sort of a calculated risk where we knew that if we wanted to like stay in it a year and that gets our money back out of it. And then if we hate it, we can sell the van. Great. And yeah, so I guess that's quite literally a calculated risk. You talked about, you know, the van depreciating. It sounds like you guys definitely did your homework on in terms of like knowing that, but also putting the work into it. And then you said allocating basically a year's worth of rent towards your van conversion, which is a good kind of a rule of thumb. Was it like, were you in like a kind of a, mo a mundane routine wanting more out of life? Or was it just one of those things where you had always wanted to travel and that's why you um, got the remote jobs in the first place? I don't think we, we loved Seattle yeah. and I don't think we were ready to leave. We thought we were going to go back. So I, I have a real, me personally, I have a real bad habit of sticking in a routine, loving a routine, having a like coffee shop barista, like know my name, you know, every, like I want, I love that. Sarah, I love her, but she's the exact opposite of that. And where she's like, Hey, we've been here for three days. It's time to burn this place to the ground and let's <laughs> go to the next one. But like she just loves to travel, and I think that's kind of where it came, uh, where it came from too. Is that uh, we wanted to like, cause I I love to travel as well, but we we really wanted to see other places. And living in Seattle at the time, you know, with the amount of money that we were making, Seattle is great, and there's a lot of things to do there. But it did make it hard to visit other places in the world because we were paying so much. Yeah. Yeah, the routine is definitely one thing you can't take with you when you're traveling. It's whether it's <laughs> full time, part time, that's you just can't get into routine if you're in a different location every said three, four days. So it's hard, but I felt I we feel like the traveling in a vehicle, like in a van or in our truck camper, it actually does allow for a little bit more of a routine versus like mm -hmm. a hotel or an Airbnb because we always have everything we need with us. So we always have like our um, outdoor gear, our running gear, or you know, we can make our favorite meals in the truck that kind of like keep us accountable for eating healthier and that kind of thing. So it does allow for a certain amount of routine, which is nice, but yeah, it's never perfect. No, I, I think that's sort of like the in-between as we've, we found that that's the way to go for yeah. us if we can. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's a good point. It's all perspective. We actually talked about this with Chad and Eileen a little bit too, but yeah, it's a routine where you can, you can control what you can do in terms of time when you wake up, what you're doing, you know, in regards to the van, but going to your favorite coffee shop or going to the gym down the street, those are things that depending on where you are, you might not have access to. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, for, for sure. sure. So you talked about that job over in Taiwan. That was kind of, I guess, your first overseas job, your digital, digital nomad job. Um, how did you get that job? So actually, yeah. we are self-employed. So we yeah. were already doing the whole like, it wasn't, we went over there to visit friends and we did a little bit of a gig. They sort of work with a nonprofit, but that was just more like an invite. They came, asked us to like come over there and do some filming documentary yeah. work kind of stuff. And that, yeah. And it, we had been working freelance for, for so long at that point yeah. that when our friends in Thailand invited us over, like it was sort of like, it was one, especially for me, it was one of those like mind, like blowing moments of like, oh, I can work from here and, you know, and nobody my clients or whoever just they won't know as long as i get the work done it's totally fine and um and that's what that was so beautiful about it that was great about it yeah so we didn't really have to go through the whole job searching process for that gig because we just were already doing the same thing we just did the same thing that we we're doing in the states and then took it over to thailand with us mm -hmm. um and it was pretty seamless the, the beauty of going to asia is that you're always we were what 12 hours ahead mm -hmm. so we were never missing deadlines we were always 12 hours ahead of whatever deadline so it always gave us like this yeah. half a day cushion which is kind of cool so yeah we never really had any issues with clients or anything no, like that no the only thing like is if anybody ever wanted to schedule a meeting 
it was either 8 a.m., you know, their time or like 8 p.m. our time, you know, like that. It's just because of the time difference. But other than that, nobody knew. Worth it. Yeah. Yeah. As long as they weren't scheduling them at noon, our time, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> there were a few like that, I yeah. think. But most of it was pretty seamless. I mean, yeah. I'm surprised. I mean, I feel like at that point, that was 2016, so it's been a long time ago. Yeah. But I feel like high-speed internet was, it was more common. Yeah. And Thailand, like, you would think that maybe somewhere like that, the internet wasn't as good back then. But you'd be amazed. At, like, mm-hmm. we were in the middle of nowhere, yeah, Thailand, like, that. on the border of Myanmar. And, mm-hmm. like... We, we had the fastest internet speeds we had. We literally ever. were in a hut. Like we were in a hut. This wasn't even a structure and we, they had internet and that thing was blazing fast. <laughs> so I don't know how they got it up there, but it was amazing. Yeah. yeah. So you never really 2016, huh? Wow. Yeah. yeah. It's been a long time ago. That's yeah. interesting. So it sounds like kind like of now. long story short, you didn't get into, you didn't get into the remote work and the digital nomad ship just to, to travel. It's more, you had that aha moment when you were traveling and realized, oh, I'm halfway across yeah. the world and I'm actually doing this. I can do more of this. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you came back home and then a couple years after that, it sounds like, so you picked up your first Sprinter van, converted it um, outside of the van build, because we've had a number of van builds on the show so far, but what should someone be prepared for when transitioning to that life? <laughs> oh man. Um, it's never as glamorous as it looks online, but I feel like that, I feel like people have done a really good job at like debunking that glamour of van life. Mm -hmm. That's become more of a thing where people are showing an honest side and I really appreciate that. Um, I, you know, it's so weird because I feel like the biggest thing that we used to warn people about if you're working on the road is internet. The internet has changed with Starlink. Starlink has changed the game for us. So like even the biggest hiccup that we had the first two years is gone. I think, I think the biggest piece of advice that we give people who are interested in doing van life or try, you know, anything like that is to rent one first Mm, and like rent it for a week, two weeks, whatever it, yes, it is a little expensive to do that, but it's far cheaper to do that. It's far cheaper to do that than be stuck with a, you know, $60,000 van or whatever, you know, and then besides the conversion. And so, um, it, yeah, that's what we tell people is rent it, see how well you like living in a small space. So we had the longest to the biggest Sprinter van when we first started off. Is that a fly? Yeah, sorry. sorry. <laughs> um, we, so we had the longest Sprinter van when we started off because we were like, all right, we're going from an, a, a thousand square foot apartment to what was it? Like 250? It was 80, 80, 85 square, square feet. feet or something. Yeah. And we were like, we just want the most space. And then we got into that and we were like, oh, you know what? We could actually downsize. And so we went to a second van, which was smaller, um, about, you know, it was 19 feet in, in total length, right? Yeah, it was five feet shorter than the first one. Yeah. And, and so, it's amazing how little you need. But yeah. that's like the beauty of running too is I wish we had rented early on, but we didn't. So mm-hmm. that's one piece of advice we offer people that we didn't actually do. But rent a van. And then even if you know for sure you're going to like living in a small space, you can learn by renting a van like what you do and don't need in a van. Mm-hmm. Like you may realize, oh, I definitely want AC or I really want an indoor shower or I don't actually need an indoor shower. So all those little things will kind of save you a lot of time and a lot of headache later on. Sure. You had mentioned, so you downsized, you sold the first van, got one that was five feet shorter. Were there any other things you did differently to that build after having done an entire van conversion? Um, let's see. The, oh, well, no. the only thing that we did that we wanted to keep, but we couldn't keep what we had an oven in, in oh, our first man, van and that. we love that oven and but we just couldn't put it into this new the new van the second van well, we opted to make the second van all electric the first one we had electric and we had propane but mm-hmm. this one we had like a mass the second one we had a massive battery bank and so we didn't really have we didn't, we didn't want to put propane in there too which yeah. is what the oven would have run on yeah. so that yeah. was a we missed that and then we went to four wheel drive from two wheel drive which was really nice that was yeah. That was actually probably needed uh, yeah. for what we wanted to do because our van could, our previous van was, you know, two wheel drive. It, it could get most it did, places. Yeah, I went a lot of places. It did, but it was still, it, you just want some extra like comfort knowing, okay, I could probably get out of the situation if I need, need to get out of that. <laughs> yeah, and you get a little extra clearance. And yeah. I mean, I feel like the, having the freedom of four wheel drive, we actually found ourselves in more... Uh, sticky situations. <laughs> we never had that with the two wheel drive one, but yeah, yeah, I just gotta be careful. <laughs> yeah, not only can it get you, you know, out of situations, but it can get you to places where you simply can't go if you're in two wheel drive. We have a class B two wheel drive, and we missed out on probably a handful of campsites on on I Overland or um, yeah. 
yeah, I overlander um, that we couldn't get to because they would caution you, you know, you need four wheel drive. And when it's late, you're trying to find it doesn't sound that important. But if it's really late and you're tired and you want to crash somewhere, but you can't get there, you're kind of kicking yourself. Obviously, it's, there's more money yeah. that comes yeah. with four wheel drive. But um, I would say after going out west once, it's worth it if you can afford it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I would agree with that. Yeah. We didn't realize how much we wanted until we had it. We have our generator that sits about five inches off the ground underneath our van. And I was looking at it yesterday and I was changing the oil and there's all these like scrapes and scratches on I'm like, oh man, oh, that's, no. that's not good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> be mindful. Yeah. Those would be, that's, uh, that's the worst sound too when you're driving and then you bottom out and it's like that sound of metal yeah. and rock. It's like, oh, oh. it's awful. Yeah. <laughs> You've done that yeah I hit it too. once, yeah. and I, but we, we rent it out and I, I put signs like low clearance, no caution, but... It yeah. looks like there's there's been a couple that have been added to that. So now those are yeah. <laughs> cost of doing business, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Great. So when you started out traveling in your van for the first time, I know you were working full time, but were there any steps or actions you took to make sure you were okay financially starting out? Mm. I guess we talked about the money setting aside one year's worth of rent for the van build, but actually traveling. Yeah. Um a great question you know and we have we always being self-employed we always have a bit more of a cushion than i guess you know they always say like have three months salary saved just in case anything were to happen but we always try to do more than that just because we're self-employed because mm -hmm. work is already kind of unpredictable so we had that going into it. i don't think we did anything too crazy different than that no. just because we knew we were going to be living pretty inexpensively yeah i mean if we were really like pent and this never really happened, but I mean, it would cross our mind to be like, you know what? We've driven a lot and gas is by far the most expense. Mm -hmm. Like it's the, the largest expense you'll have when okay. driving in, in a van or whatever. And so if we really wanted to like just save some money, we would just stay put, you know, yeah. it's just far cheaper just to stay in one place. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Stay put, bring your own They're groceries and affordable. just it up. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, when you're, when you've got everything you need in the van, like eating out and gas are like the two biggest things. But if you can find a beautiful national forest out West or something and just like hunker down there for a week or two, you can live really affordably. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's really, yeah. really cheap. Yeah. The key so words in that sentence are out West. That's how we've yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's so much harder on the East coast. It is. It's hard on the East coast. Yeah. yeah. Linnea put it perfectly in episode nine. She said, East of the Mississippi, it's difficult out West of that. You're, you're golden, but East of the Mississippi, it's, it's tough finding free places to camp. Yeah. Yeah, it is, unfortunately. So in that same year, you guys did your second van conversion. You ended up buying a house as well. Um, what led to you guys coming to that decision? And how important do you think it is for someone who's traveling full time to have a home base? Hey guys, I wanted to take a quick break to tell you about Delicia Oats. We've been enjoying Delicia Oats for many years and they have helped fuel us for those extra long hikes. They are flavored oats that come in a pouch and are very easy to set up. Just add water, give it a shake and let it sit overnight and enjoy the next morning. Or you can add boiling water if you like them served hot. We've also added them to our morning smoothie, or I'll sprinkle some into my yogurt for some extra flavor and to help fill me up. You can make them in less than a minute, and there is no cleanup, which is huge for us on the road. Now, if you're like me, the first question you'll ask is, how much added sugar is there? And here's the big one for me. No added sugar. They come in a variety of flavors. My personal favorite is cherry chocolate. Enjoy them for yourself by placing an order at deliciaoats.com and use the coupon code PATH at checkout. That's deliciaoats.com, D-E-L-I-C-I-O-A-T-S.com and use the coupon code PATH. Mm, yeah. That was our COVID house. Yeah. So people <laughs> had COVID babies or COVID puppies. We bought a COVID house because we didn't know what was happening. And we were in well, the, well, it was like a yeah. need. It, it was a need because things had gotten to a point where we weren't able to depend on like, we had been using family as an address. And that mm -hmm. just became a point of, we needed our own space to build out a second van and we needed our own address because that wasn't an option anymore. So yeah. we had to either rent something again or buy it, mm -hmm. but it ended up being cheaper just to buy. So we bought and that was, it's been great. I mm -hmm. mean, it's been a source of income. We've Airbnb it out in the past and um, it's just nice to have a home base. It's not something that would have been possible when we were in our first van, but it's something that, you know, we sold our first van early on in COVID. And then the profit we made off that van went towards um, buying our second van and then also a down payment on our house. Mm -hmm. So like saving up all that money, living in that van for a year and a half sort of put us in a good position that we were able to have the house and the van, which is something we didn't think was going to happen for a few more years. So that's, yeah. it's been nice to have that, um, to be able to, like fall it, back yeah, on it. it's been nice to have a home base to go back to because 
after traveling so much, like traveling's awesome and, and people can over glamorize it and just be like, wow, it's amazing. You're at a beach every day or you're in the Alps or wherever you're having these amazing experiences. But at the end of the day, like you're really tired, you know, especially if you're like traveling and going to different places all the time. And sometimes it's just nice to be somewhere and veg and like <laughs> not worry, not worry about it because uh, you can become very, um, uh, used to traveling. And so it takes the specialness out of it. And even having a home base is you're able to sort of reset and then get excited about it again. You know, you're not kind of burned out of going to a new place each day. And I saw somebody actually yesterday talking about how, you know, she mentioned that she wanted to get a home base in the next year. Or so she lives on the road too. And she said that she was met with a lot of criticism of people who do the whole van life or the life on the road thing for a couple of years. And then they buy a house and it's like they've given up. But to us, if you still love traveling, I, I don't view it as giving up. I viewing it, I view it as progress of we can have the best of both worlds. It took a lot of planning and saving to get to that point, but mm-hmm. it keeps us sane. And I feel like in the long run, it's we're gonna be able to sustain the travel lifestyle for a longer because we can go back and have those breaks. You know, we can have yeah. a normal shower and laundry and dishwasher and like the luxuries of home yeah. and then go back out there again. I just want to know who these people are making up these like weird rules that you can't have both, you know? It's like, no, you can. <laughs> like nobody said you can't, you know? It just so, takes planning though. Yeah. A lot of planning and saving. Yeah, like is there a rule set in stone where you have to be traveling a certain amount of days out of the year if you have a home base to be considered a full time <laughs> traveler? Like, <laughs> I, just, yeah. I don't know. Somebody yeah. the other day told us they're like, you guys aren't you guys aren't nomads anymore. I'm like, we spend like three quarters of the year on the road. Yeah. Like, we're still I mean, nomadic. <laughs> yeah, even if I've got a Costco, I'm still nomadic in between my house and <laughs> Costco. So. <laughs> That's it. What's smart of you guys too to, to rent it out, but not only are you renting it out, it's not long term, but it's short term. It's Airbnb. So if you need to get in there for any reason, you can, you know, it's, it's, yeah. you have, I mean, you have people booked, but you can just cancel if you have to versus if it was a lease, it'd be a lot more difficult. So yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. We had some good experiences and some bad experiences doing that. So yeah. it's, it's risky having people stay in your house for yeah. two nights at a time. But yeah, it would be nice to have a, I think uh, looking back, if we could have something that would separate our stuff from like the guest stuff to be able to have like a dual like sort of place would be ideal. Like just, an ADU or something. Yeah, yeah, just because it's it's difficult with people renting, like because when people rent a place, they treat it like a rental, you know, yeah. it's uh, and it's, I don't blame them. Like, you know, it's a rental thing, but yeah. That, I mean, one area we'd like to move towards is like the midterm rentals too. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you guys... I'm sure you're familiar with that, but yeah, like renting out to travel nurses or something like that. That way you don't get the wear and tear of the Airbnb years, but you're not having somebody who's in there for 12 months or in there for mm-hmm. two or three months or something. And I think that's probably a sweet spot we'd like to move to eventually yeah. to generate a little bit of income. Yeah. Yeah. We actually just talked to Courtney and Dakota that do travel nursing and we're, we have a couple uh-huh. of furnished final rentals. So we do the midterm leases and, and yeah, uh-huh. they travel nurse. So they're using those when they're not in their van. And um, but yeah, the beauty with Airbnb it, in our experience so far is, and what I would tell someone who's considering doing it is if you live in your house, you can take a vacation. Like how we discovered like the power of it was we took a vacation, got back and it basically paid for itself. And we were like, this is crazy. Like the fact that we rented our house out and it paid for like, if not all a good chunk of our vacation, it was like, well, what if we got another one, did the same thing with that one. So, um, that's a great place to start is just rent it out while you're living there. Um, it makes it, Mm -hmm. it's a bit of a hassle when you have a home office, you gotta, you know, clean up and take down and, and put in a, a locked closet. But um, that's how it all began for us. Yeah. 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 Yes. I mean, you just make do with what you have to do to make travel possible. I mean, there's yeah. a lot of different ways to make it happen. We knew buying a house that that was going to probably be something we had to do, or we wanted to be okay with doing it to, you know, we just didn't know what COVID was going to do. So we told ourselves going into this house, like we need to be okay with having somebody else rent out this house part time mm-hmm. to keep us traveling. And we were, yeah. it's, just, it's just a thing at the end of the day. And Airbnb and our, we've been doing it for, I guess, five years now. And we've really, oh, wow. it, it sounds, it sounds like made up, but we've really only had one bad guest. Yeah. We've never oh, really wow. had any damaged because Airbnb does a great job and VRBO of vetting. So you can, you know, you can get the reviews. You can make sure you're only bringing in, um, you know, five star good reviews. Um, you can make it so that they have to read a message and they have to respond to it. So like our message says, there's no parties, we have neighbors, you know, be mindful, share a driveway, and they have to acknowledge yeah. it. So they actually take precautions to make sure you're bringing in good people. We had, the worst guess we had was someone who left seafood out in like in the middle oh. of July when it was hot and the entire house oh. reeked. So they didn't like damage or anything, but oh. it smelled <laughs> yeah. for like 
<laughs> like three days. It was bad. <laughs> of course, you get your normal <laughs> parent care, but yeah, one time. Yeah. Like, yeah, I guess it's five years. Yeah, that's wow. really impressive. That's amazing. That's, we can't say the same. We no. had like four bad guests back, back to back. back. And one, yeah, like it was not good. Some, yeah. Somebody like peed on the couch. We had to replace our couch. <laughs> and then we caught one of the guys peeing in our backyard across our neighbor's fence. Like a lot of pee was involved yeah. in, you know, oh, for man. whatever reason. But then yeah. we had smokers and vapors. Like these are all different guests, like back to back. And so we like... <laughs> yeah, we were like... It was, it was just like... Yeah, <laughs> it was a lot. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot that went... We we're like, all right, we're just going to take a break for a second and then we'll reset. So... <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> that's really impressive. You guys haven't had that. Like, yeah, that's amazing. Knock on the horn before you. I, something bad happened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You guys are <laughs> in Nashville. Those guests are really great. Uh, oh, we're Chattanooga. Chattanooga. So oh, about Chattanooga. A, what, so, two hours? Right, not not yeah, as Nashville. big of a party yeah. area as Nashville, I guess. But No, yeah. no, a lot of weekenders. <laughs> yeah, a lot of weekenders. Yeah, a lot of people from Atlanta and Nashville actually come and vacate. That's like where the one big mountain is in Tennessee. Big is a relative term. <laughs> it's yeah. like the only mountain around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's not too many Rocky Mountains out, out east. <laughs> no, yeah. no, not yeah, too many. Not too many. <laughs> not too many. We'll jump ahead to kind of some of the your current travel adventures. What have been some of the biggest frustrations you currently face? Ooh. Um, language I, is a one right now. Oh, you're gonna go look. I mean, our <laughs> current like our current travels, right? We're uh, working on Spanish. Yeah, we're working on Spanish, but just being able to or currently we're in Mexico and we're making our way down the Pan American Highway to Argentina, and um, but just being able to communicate correctly and responsively. Uh, locals here, you know. And I was going to say the ongoing thing, it's getting better, but even though we're self-employed, the communication with clients, some of the older clients we work with, they, you know, they follow us on social media and sometimes they get a little bit, I don't know, they get a little they, grouchy about like, yeah. oh, I see, like, they're really, how do I say this nicely? <laughs> they, they're, they're, they can be a little sensitive to even later grams. So sometimes we'll post that we're at a beach or something like that. And reality, we're probably not there. You know, we, we always were, later gram. Yeah, we always later gram. Um, but sometimes, you know, especially on a Monday morning when, you know, you're at work and you pull up Instagram in between, you know, your coffee break or whatever, and you see Chris and Sarah at the beach while you're supposed to be in a meeting or having something, you know, whatever, yeah. it can be a little like, well, why aren't you working? You know? Yeah. I think a lot of our, some of the older clients we have, they have a hard time wrapping their minds around the idea that, you no, know, we get our work done and we can go have fun. Yeah. Like that's just been like, this, it's this constant struggle to communicate and it, it involves over communication a mm -hmm. lot of the time. Like we always meet deadlines. Like that's something that we were really persistent in. Like, but it just, it still just comes with the territory. Like, especially when you post everything online, like um, that's just this constant struggle of trying to prove yourself. Yeah. That you're reliable. Yeah. Yeah, that's tough because it, it's it. I mean, every client. I mean, it's human nature. Everyone thinks they're you know they're most important. So you're right. Even if deadlines are being hit, like they're still seeing photos and videos and posts. And mm. that's a good point yeah. to bring up. That I feel like a lot of people probably wouldn't consider um if they're going to be doing remote work, working for themselves, and posting all the time. Where you got to keep your clients happy too, and that could be something you have to balance. That's a good point to bring up. Yeah, yeah. 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 I would even recommend not like like hiding your clients from your Instagram or whatever your post, like if you can, just, it's just hard to have that separation, you know? And once, and most people that we work with are su like, they understand and they get it, but occasionally you just have some people that it just, it's hard to compute. It's hard to yeah. understand. But COVID helped with that a lot, actually. And it's yeah. something good that came out of COVID is the mentality around remote work. Yeah. Like a lot of people are really okay with that more and more. So that's it's more helpful. normal. So yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. 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 You'd mentioned the language barrier. I know you're doing the Pan American Trail now, but they say like some places you go, it's not as important. It sounds like where you are now it is. Are there any, I've heard there's apps that can help with that, like translation apps are you using that could help somebody? Yeah, yeah. Google Translate is the one that gets you by. Like, I mean, we're using, <laughs> so we use Pimsleur to uh, learn Spanish. <laughs> That's great because I you listen to it before you see the words, which is good for me because I'm a good like, I learn best by listening. So you listen to it and then you do the written um, like lesson plan. So it's it's a really great program. Of all the mm -hmm. online programs I've used, Pimsleur's been my favorite, but we use Google Translate like in a pinch. Like we were at a deli yesterday and we wanted a cookie and I had to ask the lady like, do these have nuts in them? And I didn't know how to say that because Pimsleur hasn't taught me that yet. But yeah, Google Translate's really nice because it has like the, the camera translation. So you can hold it over like a menu at a restaurant and it'll translate it instantly, which is really cool. So it, for people like us who are struggling with Spanish and working on it, like it does help you in just about any situation. Like it's, it's the best one out there. 
Yeah, very cool. Perfect. Um, I know we talked about the fuel cost of fuel and then lodging over the years, but have there been any expenses, I guess, currently or over the years that have been bigger than you expected or that somebody might not expect? Mm. Mm. That's a good, that's a great question. Uh, I think, uh, so we're self-employed and health insurance is always expensive. So yeah. that kind of comes with the whole self-employed digital nomad of life. Um, so health insurance is expensive plus travel insurance and travel insurance is pretty affordable, but those are just, if we're paying for both of them on top of each other, it's like $500 a month. So that adds up if you want to go the fully remote self-employed lifestyle, like that's one you need to consider. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Any, like anything that's like, uh, we've gotten lucky and haven't had a lot of you know, maintenance issues or anything. We weird. say that, but honestly, for whatever reason, we are, attra- our vehicles are attracted to rocks uh, and we yeah. crack windshields like nobody's business. Like, and, Probably eight windshields in the last three years, four years. Yeah, right? it's at least two full windshields a year. Like not able to glue it, whatever right. they do to repair it. I mean, it's like full right. on shatters. <laughs> in, in fact, right before we came here to Mexico in Phoenix, Arizona, a rock hit our windshield and cracked it. And it was, it's just, it happens all the time. But you can't yeah, right even buy a windshield dash cam, in I the saw in the, in the yeah, video. Yeah. <laughs> Oh. You know, that was a bad day. We were like, <laughs> we're so, yeah, so looked like a big one. Yeah. <laughs> it, was it was huge. huge. And, I don't know how it did it. And we looked at, I kept like, I was doing, I was trying to do like a CSI investigation. I'm like, where did this rock come from? And I still can't figure it out on the video on the dash cam of like how it got to our windshield. That was Phoenix's gift to us. It was. <laughs> Thank and, you, Arizona. And even like when we sold our first van on the way, dropping it off to the new owner, our windshield got cracked from another rock and then buying another it it's happens all the, all the time. That's the only expense I say. Like <laughs> even with the good deductible and stuff, like it just, yeah, it gets that adds up. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and all the traveling you guys have done, it could certainly be worse. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it really could. We've gotten pretty lucky and haven't gotten stuck anywhere or had any major mechanical issues. And and we've driven a lot of miles. Our first van alone, we did like eighty five thousand miles yeah. in a year and a half. So like, oh my god, covered a lot of ground. Yeah. yeah. I think the only thing that we were really preempt of and very scared of, we were um, in our first van. We were doing the Dempster Highway in Canada, and oh we, yeah, we got lucky because we uh, pulled off, and I heard like a hissing, and I'm like, is that one of our tires? And it was. And if you don't know what the Dempster Highway is, it's this like 700 mile 500, yeah, 500, or 500 miles. Yeah, like that. something like that. <laughs> it's like dirt and gravel and it goes up to the Arctic Ocean in Canada. It's very, very remote. Um, it's beautiful up there, but there's nobody there. And so I heard this hissing and I'm like, oh, great. We have a flat right before we get on the Dempster. I'm like, Maybe we just patch it. And I found a tire guy. And the tire guy came out and looked at it and he was like, you need to replace all your tires. And they I were th- city tires. They were, we, were, yeah. we were playing with fire going on that route with the tires we had. Yeah. He was like, you can either pay me $500 now for all the tire, new tires, or you'll pay me $2,000 for me to come out there and tow No, no, no. $10,000. Or, or $10,000. Yeah. It was crazy <laughs> expensive. So just have new tires if you're going to go really off grid. It was just like being prepared kind of thing. Yeah. Like with this rig that we have now doing the Pan American, we like over prepared because we don't want to get stuck and you know, have unex- unexpected expenses. And I think sometimes just having the right gear and preparing for it can save you a lot of headache and a lot of money in the long run. Sure. Yeah, I mean, 500 bucks for a new set of tires is not a bad deal at all. So. No. <laughs> no. That was Canadian too. So. <laughs> it was cheaper there, yeah. <laughs> um, have there been any travel hacks that you've discovered along the way that could help any pathfinders save money in the future? Mm. Mm. We're always trying to save money. I'm trying to think. Travel hacks. Yeah, travel hack. Oh, uh, I'm just completely blanked on the term. What's it called? Oh, medical tourism. <laughs> yes. Have you guys done any medical tourism yet? So I don't think so. Think of it. Oh, man, guys. This is like, I actually learned about it from the people who are, you know, expat pats abroad who retire abroad. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes medical bills get really expensive in the US. So they'll retire somewhere like Costa Rica or Mexico that has really good medical care, but it's a fraction of the cost. Yeah. So abroad, we've, I've, we've both been pretty sick abroad before. And like in Thailand, I had some crazy weird bacterial infection. I still don't know how I got it. But anyway, I had this awful bug and I went to the hospital and had blood work and like all these medications. And I think it came out with like $30 was my bill. Um, Nicest hospital I've ever been in, US or not, like crazy nice hospital. And so that was like the first time we were like, oh, maybe medical care abroad is kind of a hack. And it is. It is. Hmm, And then we were in Korea last year and Chris has been wanting LASIK. And LASIK was what? 
LASIK seventy five percent off there. Yeah, well, about fifty percent off or so because LASIK here in the the average price for LASIK here in the states uh, was about five thousand dollars or so collectively, and um, over in Korea, I was able to get it like the it's called Smile, and so it's actually different than LASIK, but it's the same kind of procedure, and got it for about two thousand bucks. Yeah. And it was, yeah, like honestly, like for the price that we paid for, we stayed there. We stayed in Korea for about two and a half, three weeks, had a great vacation time, did all this other stuff, had the surgery and came home. And it was just amazing. The, the care at the hospital was amazing. Um, so professional and they had translators for me. So I, there was not a question of like what you're saying and what you're doing. You know, I knew every step of the way. And they said that most of their business is actually Americans coming to Seoul, Korea to, to have this operation done. Yeah. So we've, we have friends who will go to Mexico for dental work and, you know, the costs that they save on dental work in Mexico versus the U.S. is enough to pay for a family vacation to Mexico. Like that yeah. difference, that's how they justify coming down here for it. So they'll get a root canal and then they'll go to the beach for a few days and yeah. it's just like, it yeah. works. It's, there's a lot of different ways to go about it. So we've said, you know, if I need a hip surgery in a few years, cause I have bad hips, like I'll probably go to Maybe we'll go to India or something that's really good at orthopedics. But I mean, it's just another way to save money, especially like if you're a retiree or something. Yeah. So if you've got like a good like Chrome extension, finding cheap plane tickets, then just get a cheap, you know, medical thing and you're saving money all around. I think people are scared of it, though, because of the language barrier. But all of our doctors um, in Thailand, my doctor was uh, she went to NYU. So she had a great education. And then when I was in Korea recently, I had to go to a doctor for an ear infection. And we sat there talking and he went to Clemson and I went to UGA. So they were like an hour down the street from each other. And it was just yeah. like the small world moment. So a lot of these people are American educated and they'll go back home mm-hmm. and, you know, live back in their home country, which is kind of cool. So language barrier is usually not that big of a deal. Yeah. Even the doctor that was performing my LASIK surgery, he spoke English, but I never knew that. He would always let the translator translate for me. And we were walking out and, and she said, he's just trying to respect me, but he speaks perfect English. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a little hack. That's yeah. very interesting. Yeah, I had not heard of that on the podcast and I've, I haven't heard of that ever, actually. And that's crazy that people are driving or they're flying all the way to Korea for cheaper medical care for surgeries. Um, oh, yeah. Because that can't be a cheap plane ticket. And they're doing that. And like you said, most of their clients are U.S. based. Mm-hmm. A lot of them are. A lot of them are. Yeah. A lot of them are. So and there's certain countries that are better at certain things, but just do your research and it could be a good way to have a vacation. Yeah. Yeah. And make a vacation out of it. Yeah. <laughs> I think you're right. I think people, they think about that and they, they get concerned because it's not in the U.S. But then, like you said, if mm-hmm. you research it, I think I was watching a video with Ian and Anna where they got sick in another country and they were freaked out about how much it would cost and just being in a hospital somewhere else. But it was dirt cheap. And they, they had the same so, conclusion. Like this was really friendly, welcoming, great service. So, wow. Yeah. 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 I that. mean, cool. yeah. So you guys have your dog Kramer um, with you. <laughs> He's on the camera right now, but we just saw him. Um, you took him previously <laughs> on an international trip and you're taking him now. Obviously, you're international in Mexico, but you took him previously to Brazil and Mexico um, what mm-hmm. was that process like? Did you fly with him back then or were you driving still? Yeah. Yeah. He's actually been to Brazil, Mexico, and Korea. <laughs> it's a oh, very wow. well-traveled dog. Yeah. Um, yeah. He flies in cabin. So he's small enough to fit under the seat in front of me. Um, so he travels with us mm-hmm. in cabin and it's pretty simple, actually. I mean, certain destinations are a lot more complicated. So generally speaking, like island nations that are rabies free are going to be the most complicated. So Australia, Japan, Iceland, those are really hard hard countries to get your animal to. Mm-hmm. Um, but Korea and Brazil and Mexico, Mexico especially, like they don't even check the paperwork for the dog when driving across the border. Like they mm-hmm. don't do anything. But other than that, you just go to the vet and they fill out a form and it's really straightforward. So people think it's really hard to get an animal to travel with you, but it's not. Yeah. It just takes a little extra planning and a little extra money. It's definitely easier by car mm-hmm. than, you know, by vehicle than it is flying because then you have to deal with the airlines and, and their restrictions and all that. But you know, as long as you're, we have a great vet back in Chattanooga yeah. who she travels extensively um, or has or has people who have tra- traveled um, internationally extensively and, and she knows all the ins and outs and can help very much uh, in t- tight situations. Yeah, there's a lot of countries that don't make the process easy. It's very confusing, but if you have a good vet who will help you like navigate and make sure that you're getting everything done, 
it's not that big of a deal. Like, I mean, it's it's really pretty simple. And even getting him in the countries, like we found that most of these countries are very dog friendly. In fact, the US looks very not dog friendly now, <laughs> just because, I mean, even down here in Mexico and in Brazil and Korea, sometimes that dogs just are allowed to come right into the cafe with you. Or um, it's just, even on the subway, like everything is, you know, set up for people mm-hmm. who have animals. Yeah. So I don't, yeah, it's not that hard actually. Yeah. Was there a, um, a, well, I know there's a weight limit, like a threshold. Is that universal across all airlines or what's that weight limit? No, it varies airline to airline. Our favorite airline to travel is Delta. Theirs is pretty generous. And we've had great experiences um, with our flight attendants and just the service we get when we do have a dog. Mm-hmm. Um, Asian airlines are definitely the most difficult. Their restrictions are going to be a lot smaller because a lot of the dogs that you'll see in like Korea are just these tiny little teacup sized dogs. And so their weight limit is really (laughs) small. So Kramer can't fly to Asian airlines. He looks like a monster. Um, He looks like a monster in Asia. (laughs) It's huge. (laughs) Um, But no, it's not standard. Our... Our best advice would be to try to fly. If you're American, try to fly an American airline as often as possible. So Delta or American or United, um, those are going to be the easiest to navigate. And their restrictions for weight and size are pretty standard across the board. Mm-hmm. And if you have a direct flight from like the U.S. to the country, that makes it easier. Yeah. Uh, because then the the rules are still the like the U.S. rules are still like implied, right? Uh. It, Sometimes, but it just saves you paperwork. You're not having yeah. like to navigate and layovers and having to extra paperwork. So yeah. if you can fly direct, like we live close to Atlanta, so pretty much we can get anywhere in the world from Atlanta, and that that saves a lot of headaches. Yeah, yeah. Cool. yeah we flew with our dog once when she was a puppy, and she was under the weight limit when we left, but she grew during our vacation. Oh, so no. we, ended up having to, we we drove with her. We were going to drive anyways back up, but yeah, I think she went from like I don't know, like seven pounds to like eighteen pounds in the course of like two weeks. So oh no, she grew fast. Oh, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if you're flying with a puppy international, don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's always my fear is like yeah. that they would try a check Kramer. So I always do my yeah. diligence and research. But they've never, honestly, they've never weighed Kramer, but they'll look at him for size. So sometimes it's, I don't know. It's yeah. every airline's, you just don't want to risk it. Yeah. <laughs> We had the same thing. We were all nervous about, I and mean, we she she like by far met the weight requirements. We were like nervous about they're gonna check her weight, or, but they, they, they didn't even look at her. I don't think. Yeah. Yeah. No, I've heard the Asian airlines especially will though. That's that's why I always come back to that because I'm like, oh, Air Korea or Korean Air or whatever it is. Yeah. I've heard they're very difficult. Like they're very particular about it. So, <laughs> just a heads up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We'll start wrapping this thing up with the final five, the last five questions. So after spending quite a few years traveling, um, what is mm-hmm. one thing you've learned besides internet that you need to have while traveling? A shower. <laughs> yeah, shower, shower is like my number one. Yeah. Which unless you're an overlander, I guess that's pretty standard. <laughs> you know, like most hotels and Airbnbs are going to have showers, but we travel on the road a lot. And I think a shower is the biggest thing that I don't want to live without because it just makes you feel human when you're mm-hmm. camping off the grid <laughs> yeah yeah i'm trying to think of anything else that uh, that we need to, that we really i mean honestly most if we're ever in a pinch you can find most anything on the road um besides like so like when we travel we travel with a lot of like gear you know a lot of like youtube gear cameras and microphones and all this stuff but most normal travelers will have maybe a camera and that's yeah. it they're not carrying around like a video production sweet with them and so uh <laughs> so yeah i mean most everything that we have is there anything else that- i don't think so well, you, it's really amazing how little you need to survive and like chris said i mean you can find most everything you need around the world yeah. i can't speak to places like africa you know because i haven't been to Just, africa yet but there's your passport is the one thing you need yeah the passport pack less and get it if you absolutely have to have it later on yeah sure yeah passport and shower yeah, we were the same way the shower was a non-negotiable when we were looking around <laughs> at our at our, yeah. our van yep. yeah contrary yep. to that what is one thing you've learned that you don't need when you're traveling mm. Mm. i was trying to think of this one earlier I, saw that oh. question. I mean honestly the amount of clothes that i pack i i find that i need I could do without some, you know, I feel like I overpack a little bit just in case for different situations and those situations never arise. Mm -hmm. Um, And so like I have, like we're driving this route again and it's going to be pretty hot and humid for most of it. But I packed 
like long sleeve workout shirt and all this. And I have yet to pull it out. And I'm like, what was I thinking? Maybe I don't really need this, you know, and maybe one day in, in a few months I'll pull it out. But yeah, I think clothes are always the over packing thing yeah. for me. Yeah. Yeah. But we, even before we crossed the border into Mexico a week and a half ago, we were in San Diego and we went by FedEx and we mailed two boxes of stuff home that we just didn't need. I mean, we've done this for how many years on the road now? And then yeah. we still overpacked. We were like, we just don't need this many long sleeve shirts and pants if it's going to be 80 degrees yeah. at, the, at the minimum for yeah. the next foreseeable future for us. So yeah. yeah, you just don't need that many clothes or shoes, but we still do that. Yeah. <laughs> By far the most popular answer to that is just get close. <laughs> yeah. If you listen to this podcast when you were first starting out, um, what is one question I didn't ask tonight that you would have wished I had? And how would you answer that now? That's a, that was a hard one too. Mm -hmm. um, it's a really good question though. Yeah, it is. Um, I think the one, um, I was going to go at the angle of like, when, when, what advice do we have for like, when the time is right to jump into traveling? I feel like a lot of people are scared of that. Sure. Like they either over prepare with money or they don't prepare enough. Um, not that it's all about money, but I think there's no perfect time for anything. Yeah. We, we actually were talking with a friend who travels quite a bit and she said something that I was a little profound, but like everything is changeable. Changeable. You, yeah. Everything. Yeah. You can, you can change anything. Like if you want to go now go now, if you want to stay, like stay, like, but every, like just be flexible. I think that's the main thing is that a lot of people will plan out routes for the entire year. Yeah, and I don't know how they do that. <laughs> I don't know how they do it either because like you miss out on some of the spon like the the spontaneous moments that life will throw at you. Yeah. Um you'll miss these amazing small moments in a town or a village in the US or whatever, you know, you'll just, you know, you will like we rolled into this town in Idaho and we stayed at this Oh gosh, this, I know where you're going. This car, no, not camp. We stayed at this campground at a, um, what was it? It was a fairground was in a the fair middle ground. of nowhere, yeah. Idaho. And we were inside our truck and it was hot. So we had all the blinds in and we opened the windows like three hours later. And I kid you not, an entire circus had rolled into town, like legit a and whole like, circus. Like there were clowns, there were shriners on goat carts. Like everybody's juggling, like, and the whole town came out. And you know what? Like we were, it, it's just those beautiful, spontaneous moments that, um, if you're so rigid in your planning, you'll that I feel like those are the moments everybody wants when they travel. They're like, Oh, yeah, when I was traveling, blah blah blah, I had this cool thing happen to me. Like, you never hear anybody who plans, you know, who plans for that spontaneous moment. Like, it's just it just doesn't happen. So, just that's be good. Oh, that's yeah. really good is having flexibility in your schedule. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's a good one. Yeah, plan, but like you said, there's going to be spontaneity <laughs> anyway. So, might as well, you know. Don't might as well not plan like everything out. Whereabouts in yeah. Idaho was that? Honestly, I don't remember the town name. It was somewhere between <laughs> Boise and in Idaho Falls. Idaho right? Falls, I yeah, think. Was, I mean, like when I say it was a small town, like it was, it was probably a, really a two thousand person town. town. Yeah, really little. Yeah, somewhere right off ninety or whatever interstate that yeah, is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for someone listening to this right now who would like to set up a travel lifestyle on their own terms but isn't quite there yet, what is one thing they could start doing today? If you don't already have a job that's remote, start working your way there. Whether you want to be self-employed or whether you want to work for someone else on the road, both are great options. If you have a job that you can work remotely, it, you're going to be able to do this for a lot longer. Like you don't have to be a content creator to make this lifestyle possible. I think that's a idea that most people have is you don't have to be a YouTuber or a blogger. You can work for, you know, a normal corporate job and still be remote, but you need to start taking those steps yeah. now, whether that's like looking for a job that's already set to being remote or if you have a boss now and want to stick with that job, like start mentioning it to find out if that's something yeah. that they'll be okay with. It's harder, it's harder for you to prove to your current boss or job that you can do it remotely if it's not already remote. Like yeah. it, it's just really hard to prove that. Um, and so go in knowing that, be like, hey, I need, and there's plenty, there are plenty of jobs out there that are remote um, that people like they get it like there's corporations that all their employees are scattered all over the world and they seem to function and are performing just fine. Yeah. So um, we've yeah. just heard some people who will start planning the entire their life in a van or something where they have this strategy where like I'm working at this job now, but I'm going to go ahead and start buying the van and converting it. And in six months, I'm going to ask my boss if I can go remote. And we're, every time that scares us to death, I'm like, don't do that. Like do yeah. it the other way around. Like you don't know what they're going to say and they could even fire you if they think that you're 
going to go remote. So yeah. just, uh, I think, plan ahead and get yourself set up to a place where you can do this long term if you choose to do so. Yeah. And we have a lot of kids reach out and they're like, oh, can I just live in a van and go to college? Like when I live in a van, I'm like, no, don't do that right now. <laughs> like take your time, graduate, do all that and then get a van Like because you're not going to be able to starting with that remote work job, whether it's a side hustle, but at the very least, you're giving yourself another source of income, which mm-hmm. in For today's sure. world is important. So yeah. Very. Yep. very. Yeah. My right, last question, guys, um, were there any other YouTube channels or books that helped inspire or motivate you when you guys are starting out? Yeah. Um, the dangers. Yeah. We always reference them because they were, we were first looking into van life. There were very few van lifers online back then, like very few. Um, I know the hashtag had like maybe 100,000 posts back then. Like it was really small. <laughs> but the dangers, we are this couple. And they're the ones actually who just sailed across the ocean on the catamaran. Um, they were in a van. They've done Central America overlanding. And they've just been this like constant inspiration and help yeah. to us. Like we'll reach out to them with random questions. They're, you know, sar- I always feel like they're maybe five or 10 years ahead of us on every adventure. Like we've kind of followed them and unintentionally on these different things. Like they've gone ahead of us and done it. And so they've always offered great advice to us yeah. along the way. So that's been really helpful. Yeah. The dangers with a Z. Yeah. Dangers with a Z. Dangers. Gotcha. Very cool. We'll link their channel in the show notes below. And uh, before we let you go, so our audience isn't in too much suspense, where are we talking about for part two in travel tips? Ooh, I think we're going to talk about Southeast Asia and Thailand specifically. All right. We're going to go with Thailand. Perfect. All right, everybody, tune in in two days from now. We'll be dropping travel tips on Thailand. Chris and Sarah, thanks again for coming on. Thank you so much for having us. And that's the show. Thank you, everyone, for listening. I hope you learned as much as we did on this episode of A Travel Path Podcast. If you found any value, please consider writing a review on whatever platform you are listening to. We read every single one, and it will help us understand what content matters most to our audience. By leaving a review, you're helping us reach our goal of empowering as many people as we can reach their travel goals. Speaking of that, please share this episode with anyone you think could benefit from it. Check out travelpath.com to access today's show notes, resources, and to hop on our forums. Before I let you go, what is one thing you can do today that will bring you one step closer to reaching your travel goals?